Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, the launch events of the Coastal High Tide Shorebird Habitat Management Guidelines. This is Vivian Fu, Communication Officer of the EAFP Secretariat. Uh, this is really wonderful to see a lot of people interested in this topic. So this webinar is jointly organized with the Australasian uh, Weather Studies Group. Before we get started um, officially, I would like to go over a few notices for you to participate in today's event. And first of all, um, during the webinar, it will be helpful to mute your mic so that it won't be disturbing the speakers. Second, please type your question to the speakers in the chat box. You can find a speech bubble at the bottom of the Zoom app. And if you have any questions, uh, well, you still have to find the chat box to, to uh, raise the questions. Um, we will collect these questions to, and deliver to the moderator and the speakers. And lastly, we are live streaming this webinar on the EAAFP's Facebook page. So please feel free to share the Facebook post. Um, this is today's rundown. And please go to the next slide, please. After the welcoming speech, we will have um, um, Dr. Mitchell Jackson and Phil Straw from AWSG to give an overview of the coastal high tide shorebird habitat management guidelines. Mm -hmm. Then we are honored to have Professor oh, Richard speak. Fuller for yeah. the University of Queensland mm -hmm. to moderate the discussion with seven panelists from China, Hong Kong SAR, Aro Korea, Vietnam, Indonesia, Thailand and Malaysia. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our chief executive, Mr. Doug Watkins to mark the opening of this webinar. Um, because um, Doug is in the meeting at this moment, so we are going to share his recorded speech. So my, please, uh, my team, please help to share the video from Doug, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Doug Watkins, the Chief Executive of the East Asian Australasian Flyway Partnership Secretariat. I welcome you to the launch of the Coastal High Tide Shorebird Habitat Management Guidelines. These guidelines have been developed by the co-organiser of this event, the Australasian Weather Studies Group, AWSG. The Partnership Secretariat works with our 39 partners to conserve migratory water birds and their habitats across the flyway. The partnership recognises that healthy wetlands are critical for migratory water birds and to deliver stronger livelihoods for the local people that also depend on these wetlands. To safeguard populations of migratory water birds, the partnership is building a flyway site network of internationally important sites for migratory water birds. This network currently has 150 sites across 19 countries of the flyway. Today, our partner, the Australasian Weather Studies Group, we will present their new publication, Coastal High Tide Shorebird Habitat Management Guidelines to promote the importance of high tide roosting habitats for migratory shorebirds and inform their management. Understanding the importance of this habitat and the need for intertidal wetlands will pave the way for effective conservation measures for migratory shorebirds. Overcoming the language barrier across the flyway is essential for biodiversity conservation. I'm very pleased that the guidelines will be available in seven languages of the flyway to ensure a wider audience can access them. Thanks for the fantastic work by AWSG, site managers and conservationists in translating the guidelines. The AFP Secretariat looks forward to the use of the guidelines to manage shorebird roost sites. I hope you will be inspired by the speakers and the panelists today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, I would like to pass on the platform to Dr. Micha Jackson and uh, Phil Straw from AWSG to give us an overview of the coastal high tide shorebird habitat management guidelines. So Micha and Phil, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Vivian, and thank you to everyone for joining. Uh, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Great, thank you. 
Thank you so much to the EAFP and the Australasian Waiter Study Group for uh, their support in the development of these guidelines and hosting the webinar uh, today. My name is Misha Jackson. I'm a researcher based in Australia, and I'm one of the co-editors of the guidelines. Uh, so myself, as well as uh, my co-editor, Phil Straw, who I'll introduce uh, very soon, uh, will just give a very brief overview of how the guidelines uh, came about, as well as uh, very briefly some of the, the highlights of the content. But I will also share with you in just a moment the links where you can download the guidelines uh, yourself um, from the web. Uh, I just wanted to go back to, to the birds uh, for a moment. So if you can imagine, use your imagination while watching this short video that each of these little balls of light is a shorebird. It's uh, good to remember that in coastal areas, uh, life for the shorebirds revolves around the tide. So you can see by imagining that these little pieces of light are shorebirds that as the tide is going out, the birds are spreading out onto tidal flats, maybe looking for food. And then as the tide is coming in, they're gathering together uh, in smaller groups uh, above the high tide mark. And so this is really the uh, foundational uh, reason why we need to consider high tide habitat uh, roosting sites. So on lower high tides, when the high tide doesn't come up too high, uh, coastal shorebirds can sometimes roost or, or rest, have their period of rest and digestion um, on the upper tidal flats. So you can see in this photo here, lots of wimbrels are uh, still standing on the available uh, 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 upper tidal flats. However, uh, in many places, oh, Screen is stuck. There we go. In many places, uh, especially if there maybe has been some reclamation or if the shoreline is a seawall rather than a natural shoreline, during the high tide period, the whole tidal flats might be covered up by seawater. And so uh, at this time, the shorebirds need somewhere else to go on the inside of the coastline or on the inside of the seawall. Um, and so we, we sometimes call these supratidal habitats, just meaning above the high tide. Um, and in the, the East Asian Australasian flyway, in many cases, uh, these areas behind uh, the, the upper tidal flats, behind uh, the high tide mark, might be what we, we call working coastal wetlands or production areas. So things like uh, salt works or ports or aquaculture ponds. And, and during especially those really high tides, shorebirds need to find some habitat for roosting at high tide in these types of areas. So uh, how did these guidelines come about? Well, uh, this topic was very interesting to me. And in 2016, I started a, a PhD and I was focusing a lot on this high tide uh, aspect of shorebirds life. And uh, many other people who I spoke to uh, were saying that uh, maybe academic writing, so those uh, journal articles or scientific papers are not very friendly for site managers. They might be hard to understand. Um, they might not be very interesting and they might not be very practical. Also, people were saying that although they know about some important high tide sites, there might not be a lot of uh, reports or documents from these sites that can help uh, new managers to understand what are some of the important things to consider uh, for high tide habitat management. So uh, I thought maybe there's a way to combine the expertise that we already have all through the flyway and help uh, provide a resource for site managers to get some ideas about uh, how, how they could manage sites uh, at high tide to support shorebirds. So uh, how did we do this? Well, of course, we looked at the literature. So what documents were already available and how could we draw on those, bring them together and express them in a way that is quite simple. And uh, one of the ways we tried to demonstrate that these guidelines are evidence-based is that we have an appendix which goes alongside the guidelines. So if uh, something is said in the guidelines about roosting behavior, for example, there will be a reference and you can then go to the appendix and see a scientific study or a report which tells you more about this topic, which tells you uh, why we think that this is the case. Um, but to develop the guidelines themselves, uh, we had a workshop about this topic at the first East Asian Australasian Flyway Shorebird Science Meeting, uh, which took place in 2020. And uh, this was an open workshop, uh, anyone could attend. 
and we just asked anyone who was interested in this topic uh, to, to come and have a chat and see whether people thought it would be a good idea to try and develop some guidelines like this. And uh, quite a lot of people came and said that they thought this would be a useful thing to do. And so we invited anyone who might want to, to, uh, to uh, spend some time working together, which we did over the six months after the workshop to uh, uh, come up with these written guidelines. So uh, huge thanks to uh, the many uh, contributors to this. Of course, everyone who came to the workshop as well as those people listed here who contributed to the final text. Uh, also to uh, the translators, some of whom you will hear from uh, on our expert panel today, uh, as well as the graphic designer, but, but also to all of the people working on this issue around the flyway. I mean, uh, this is, these guidelines are just uh, a, a, a way that we hope will usefully bring together expertise. It's not uh, new knowledge, it's just drawing on uh, the amazing work and all the hard work of people all around the flyway who have been working on uh, habitat management for many years. And also just acknowledge here some organizations who uh, have indicated their support for the guidelines um, and, and their content. So that's just a very brief background of uh, how the guidelines came about. And I will turn over next to uh, my co-editor, uh, Phil Straw, and he's going to tell you uh, the exciting part, uh, actually what some of the content and findings of the guidelines are. And then I'll turn over to our wonder, wonderful moderator, Professor Richard Fuller, who will introduce uh, each of our wonderful panelists who will share some of their thoughts about this important issue of uh, high tide habitat management throughout the flyway. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Misha. It's uh, great to uh, be involved with so many people on uh, something that I've been doing for many, many years. Um, that is trying to work with flight managers for uh, managing for migratory shorebirds. And, uh, that has been fairly difficult over the years. And for a long time, we've needed some guidelines such as this that can go to all flight managers across the flyway and uh, help to uh, us to work uh, in, a, uh, in a uniform way to protect the shorebirds. Uh, shorebirds select a site where they can avoid danger with a clear view of approaching predator, whether that is humans, dogs, foxes, or birds of prey such as fal uh, falcons. This is a very important aspect and a lot of people uh, uh, don't really appreciate that and uh, wonder why they have problems uh, managing for motor shorebirds. Um, avoiding locations where there are many people is one of the main things for motor shorebirds. If they have dogs running across mudflats and roosting areas, then um, they cannot use the site. Uh, roost sites may provide opportunities for shorebirds to continue feeding well, the incoming tide is where the birds are moving up to the high tide, can still um, feed uh, on the way uh, in, in the tide. And um, uh, well, well, well it's, uh, there is still wet sand and shallow water. The roost site is beneficial to it, where it is close to feeding habitat. This is very important because if a bird has to fly a long way between the feeding habitat and roost sites, they're using up a lot of energy and uh, fat reserves, which is desperately needed during migration. Now, in the Southern Hemisphere, where we are, there's a huge migration starts uh, before the breeding season, where the birds move on to the Yellow Sea and then up to the breeding grounds. So they must put on a huge amount of weight here. Then in the Yellow Sea, they put on a lot more uh, fat res reserves that have been used up in that first 10,000 kilometers. So um, that next, thanks, uh, Misha. Here is a good example of a roost site where the birds are um, feeding on the intertidal uh, mudflats. They're moving up into the high, uh, higher, uh, higher areas of the, um, the beaches and um, foreshores where they can roost, um, but they can still feed as they move forward. Now. Um, uh, so they, they continue feeding on um, benthic animals such as worms and other benthic animals here. Um, 
the area is largely clear of tall vegetation, providing a clear line of sight of any approaching danger, including predators, as I've mentioned previously. Although in this picture, there's a raised road passing across the back of the um, wetland, shorebirds have a lot of room to keep clear of this barrier and have a clear view of the a very large area of tidal flats um, towards the photographer of this uh, picture. Um, invertebrate prey species will depend on salinity levels, uh, amongst other things, and different shorebirds tend to specialize in a variety of organisms depending on the length of bill and shape of the bill. So that's uh, extremely important. Um, again, next one, uh, Nisha, thanks. Now, managing the uh, uh, high tide bridge sites, uh, um, we need to uh, limit disturbance. That is a, a crucial uh, um, importance as much as possible by managing visitors and engaging local community and visitors to the site to what we're trying to do. Uh, Well-designed interpretive signage, such as this one here, um, it's very useful showing how and why the site is designed and managed in a particular way. This includes um, vegetation management along with water depths and safe places for Maori shorebirds to roost and feed. Um, that's just some very uh, quick points um, that uh, we cover in, this, in the guidelines. I hope you all enjoyed reading those and um, putting them into practice. And I uh, hope uh, if you have uh, any questions or queries that you might contact us at some stage. Uh, I think now our time has appeared, so I think we might pass over now to uh, Professor uh, Richard Fuller and hear of our, from our panel of experts um, with uh, Richard uh, um, facilitating that section. So Richard, can you take over from now? Thank you. That's great. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Misha and Phil, for that uh, brilliant introduction to the guidelines. It's so exciting to see them um, come to shape and come online. So uh, we'll be able to download and read them soon, which is a wonderful thing. Now, it's a great privilege that we've got a, a panel of experts from around the flyway uh, who have joined us today to talk about uh, shorebird roost site management in their particular region of interest. And each panel member will spend a few minutes uh, talking about uh, the issues that they would like to raise. Uh, and if questions occur to you during their presentation, please type them in the chat and then we'll put the questions to the expert panel at the end of the panel session. So please type any questions into the chat if you have them. So we'll get going with the panel discussion. It's a great pleasure to introduce Tataya Bidiaba who is the Executive Director of the Bird Conservation Society of Thailand. I think you were just on mute there. Okay. Great. Hi. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tataya, Director of the Bird Conservation Society of Thailand. For high Thai roots management, I would like to talk about Park Thale Nature Reserve. It's the BCST conservation site base. Uh, in September 20, uh, two, 2019, the BCST complete the land purchase at Park Thale, but land Peshaburi province the land purchase was aimed to establish a secure habitat for spoonbill, sandpiper, and shorebird and other shorebird at Bakthale. Bakthale is a coastal area dominated by South Pans, also part of the inner Gulf of Thailand. Important bird area as recognized by BirdLife International and the most important area in Thailand for coastal shorebirds in terms of abundance and diversity. The area of Bakthale site is about 50 hectares, hosts over 7,000 water birds during Northern Hemisphere winter, comprise, comprising 50 species, including several globally threatened migratory birds 
such as critically endangered spoonbill sandpiper and endangered spotted green shank, red knot, and far eastern curlew, is part of the Bakhtale Lampakbia flyway site recognized as a priority site on the East Asian Australasian flyway as a regular wintering site and migration passage of several globally threatened species. The South Pan also play an important ecological role in that with the loss of natural habitat. The less saline pans are used by shoppers for roosting and feeding during high tide. Aquaculture is the other major livelihood activity in the area and shellfish collection take place on the coastal mudflats. Most land at Bakhtale is owned by a few major landowners, not the south farmers. Locally, there's another risk of pollution from local industry, which may damage aquaculture and salt pans. A low but significant level of netting of birds is also a threat. For long-term goal, uh, habitat at Bakhtale is protected and enhanced for shorebirds, and the site is recognized for its international importance for shorebirds and as a tourism destination demonstrating sustainable coexistence with, between nature and local livelihood. BCST uh, has set a priority, priority action to be Carry out at Bakhtale Nature Reserve between uh, 2020 and 2021 as follows Build new earthen embankment around the reserve property. Uh, second month, uh, we have a monthly bird survey in Bakhtale Lampakbia. The third, decide, we decide a construct but washing high for visitor based on a high that BCST co-design for Kokam Nature, Research, Nature Conservation Club. The, the high spot was built upon the new embankment around the reserve to allow, allow visitor to observe shoppers at close range without disturbing, disturbing shoppers. And fourth, we collaborate with the Department of Marine and Coastal Resources under the project Urban Forest, which BCST will focus on the zoning of Bakhtale for both mangrove plantation and managing shorebird habitat. And the fifth is uh, we preventing coastal erosion at Bakhtale in collaboration with the government agency, the MCR, through bamboo facing along the shoreline of the distance of about four kilometers. Uh, and that's all uh, Bakhtale area from Thailand. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tato. It sounds like a very complex landscape for roosting birds, as is typical of many places, I think, around the flyway. So that's a great opening example of the challenges that, that we face with management. Uh, next, I'll hand over to Fion Chung, who's the manager of flyway planning and training at WWF Hong Kong. Fion, thank you. Thank you, Rich. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, sorry that I don't have a PowerPoint, but uh, in my sharing, I would like to show you uh, a map first so that you can have an idea uh, about the Maipo Nature Reserve that WWF Hong Kong is now helping to manage. So. Uh, I hope that you can all see this map. And uh, it is a bit strange because um, I have to say that about two thirds of our nature reserve is composed of what we call traditional gateway like this. And outside the traditional gateways, there is a broad mangrove forest. And then outside that, a very broad uh, mudflat area. So uh, when uh, that is an extreme, uh, Tidal level or during the, uh, the spring tide, the mudflat is immersed by seawater. So 
that's why the shorebirds have to fly inside our gateway uh, as a roost. And in order to provide a suitable habitat to the shorebirds, we especially uh, uh, designated six gateway as a high tide roosting site. And so you can see the picture here. And in the following part, I would like to show you some pictures to share with you some difficulties that we are now uh, having in order to manage the high tide roost. So in the following part, I would like to show you um, the management work that we are now doing, especially uh, tackling with the vegetation problem, uh, which is highlighted in the guidelines. And in here, I would like to show you the situation of three high tide roosting sites that we are now managing. And then I would like to show you some picture. So I hope that you can see it soon. Okay. So can you see yes, the show right. here? Yes. Okay. So um, this is the first um, high tide roost that I would like to share. This is a, a very small high tide roosting site, uh, which is only about two hectare large. But that you can see if you have a uh, proper water level. And uh, in fact, it is quite good in attracting different shorebirds. So here you can see. Here, another another corner, and in a broader view. So, um, if we would like to provide a good roosting site, high tide roosting site to shorebirds, um, there are I would say there are two major factor, uh, factors related to the habitat. The first one is the water level. As you can see, um, a shallow water is the best for the migratory shorebirds, especially in Hong Kong, because if they arrive in August or September, in fact, Hong Kong is still quite hot. So if you have a kind of shallow water, um, then they can feed and also they can help to, uh, to cool down a bit through their necks. So as you can see, this is a very suitable uh, water level to them. And also the vegetation around, it would be the best if it is very, uh, open wheel and not much vegetation, especially tall trees. So this is a uh, smaller high tide roosting site. And then next, I would like to show you a bigger one. So this high tide roosting site is about five hectare large. As you can see, we particularly created some uh, bird islands, but uh, unfortunately, as you can see, uh, they are occupied by quite a lot of grass and sometimes mangrove. And there are birds outside, but they do not use the bird islands. So that's why every year we have to do some kind of habitat management work. So the first one, um, this photo is showing what hap was happening before grass cutting. So another island. And we, in fact, drain down this uh, traditional spring pond a bit so that we can um, we can have our colleagues to help going inside to cut the grass. So this is when we drink this uh, this uh, this corn. The water level is suitable for shorebirds, so that's why you can still see quite a lot of shorebirds here and here. So even there are some kinds of vegetation on the islands or around. If the water level is suitable and the area is large enough, it is still attractive to shorebirds. And the way that we cut the grass is by menu on this uh, in this site. So my colleagues working hard in the summer time to do this, but um, the grass grow back every maybe two months. So it is a very regular work have to be carried out. So after grass cutting like that. So lastly, I would like to show you the largest uh, high tide roosting site that we have. Um, so again, before any grass cutting work, as is a marsh, but uh, or, or a grassland in fact. So uh, the background is Shenzhen side. You can see a lot of islands, but 
occupied by grass. It's a whole wheel. And uh, vegetation is really an enemy to wetland manager, I have to say. And so we have tried many different methods, or mainly physical ones, in order to tackle the, with the problem. So I would like to share the experience that, or what kind of uh, the methods that we have been trying. So the first one is using the grass cutting vehicle. As you can see here, uh, very e efficient, but the problem is um, the grass growing along the slope cannot be cut by the vehicle. So we still need uh, our colleague to cut the grass manually. So after cutting like this, so um, this is the first thing, uh, the, the, the first tool that we use. And of course, we still need our colleagues to help cutting the grass, especially at the slope area. And it's quite interesting. You can see from this picture that our colleagues are working here, but at the back there are quite a lot of strawberries. So, um, if uh, this high time roosting site is about 15 hectares large, so one five, so it's large enough for the shorebirds to really adapt to any human disturbance. Yeah. Okay, and um, in 2019, we tried another tool, which is a rotatula. So here is a video. Um, rotatula is in fact like this. The, the farmer used on the farmland. So after winter tilling, we can see the habitat like that, um, very messy, uh, but uh, it is quite attractive to birds. Okay, so after using uh, winter tiller and our police to help them to grass and to, to cut the grass, it's like that. Yeah, so. Uh, you can see this island cut manually and also by the vehicle and here by the water tiller and have uh, in the in, in in the winter of uh, uh, 2019 and 2020 in fact we find quite a lot of uh, shorebirds using the area water tilted by the water tiller like this and if you have a pair of sharp eyes you can see it's kundu sandpiper inside <laughs> <laughs> of course, in the middle, you know, in the middle is the school bill sandpiper. <laughs> yes, so um, using rotor tiller seems to help uh, treating the vegetation problem, but later on we discover other problems. Uh, the first one is after rotor tilling, it seems that the grass uh, was spread uh, in a more serious way than before. That is the rotor tiller may help spreading the grass. Uh, so it is not something that we would like to happen. Uh, so at this year, we stopped using rotor tiller. Yeah. And another problem that after using the rotor tiller, you can see that there are very many mud raising up. And according to our field workers, in fact, uh, it is difficult for them to use the grass cutters to cut the grass growing on this rotor tiller area because this is not smooth at all. So it's quite rough. Um, so that's why this year we stopped it using the rotor tiller, but try other methods. So in the following, I would like to share with you what we are now doing this year. So uh, the same, same pictures uh, after grass cutting and using the grass cutting vehicle without using the rotor tiller, it looks like that. And this year we choose to use a uh, flooding as a tool to treat the vegetation. So after grass cutting, as you can see here, are the area that has been cut. And on our left hand side, you can still see some long grass because we like to uh, something like doing a trial to see whether flooding can directly reduce the growth of, uh, of the cut grass and also the uh, uncut grass. So here is uh, after grass cutting, we start flooding the area, the 15 hectare large area. And you can see some birds started to come, but mainly cattle egrets and polar the crows because there are quite a lot of insects after grass cutting. And here is another photo. So at the back is our uh, bird watching high. Yeah. Okay, and then partially flooded, the water level being raised. 
and this is some uh, these uh, these are some pictures that I took yesterday, um, quite fully flooded by water. And uh, we started uh, flooding this area in early August, and our plan is to keep it being flood uh, until the end of uh, this month or early next month. So we will uh, lower the water level in the um, in the coming month, so that this site can be well prepared for the migratory shorebirds arriving Michael Nature Reserve. So this is uh, some sharing from Michael Nature Reserve, and I really hope that um, we can share experience in um, fighting against uh, our enemy. <laughs> the vegetation so that we can provide a good um, high tide risk size to migratory shorebirds in the fly week. So thank you. That's absolutely wonderful, Fionn. Thank you very much indeed. I mean, my pie really is one of the jewels in the crown of this flyway. So it's wonderful to hear uh, from, uh, uh, from Hong Kong there. Thank you so much. Um, our next expert panelist is uh, Lou Kai, who's co who is a uh, advisor to the EAFP Science Unit uh, and also Beijing Forestry University. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Sorry, I think I need to tell my colleagues to mute him. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, I want to share you with a few slides. Uh, I don't know whether you can see the screen. Yes, that's perfect. Uh, it's it's a PowerPoint or it's a, it's a it's an Excel. Uh, yeah, it's a PowerPoint. I see some. Okay, good. Pictures. Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, I would like to use a chance to introduce you a few of the practice about uh, high tide roost uh, in China. Uh, we all know, uh, I think maybe some of you already read uh, Professor Ma Zhijun's uh, paper on the, the, the new seawall in China along the Chinese coast. So, so far we have 18,000 uh, uh, kilometers long of our coastline, but uh, uh, 11,000 of it was uh, reclaimed. And fortunately in the year 2018, the central government uh, initiated uh, uh, an order that uh, all the reclamation projects must be stopped. And uh, uh, even it was approved by the local government to still it needed to be, really? need to, yes? Can, can, I, I hear some, some what is a question or what? <laughs> no? Continue? Okay. So um, luckily it, it was all stopped and then uh, so reclamation in China and also large scale re reclamation uh, also in uh, uh, the Republic of Korea all stopped in recent years. And also there are uh, good news, both from China and uh, Korea that uh, in the year 2019, we had a Yancheng uh, as the World Heritage for Bird Sanctuary. Uh, that's the fifth one in China. And then, and then this year that uh, the Korea GIPO, uh, Korea Intertidal Flight, uh, Intertidal Flights also nominated as a World Heritage List. This is uh, really a, a big achievement for all people. Uh, but even though we have stopped reclamation, we established the World Heritage, uh, but then what? Uh, we still have the sea wall. We cannot tear it down, not only uh, here uh, in China, but I, I think uh, it has similar issue uh, in the Yellow Sea ecoregion. Um, so as a, a pilot project, uh, both for uh, shorebird conservation, but also for spawn build sandpiper, uh, the Center for EF study uh, at the Beijing Forest University, and also joined with the Mangrove Conservation Foundation. We worked together with the local people at uh, Tiaozini. Uh, Tiaozini is uh, one part, very important part for the Yancheng Nature World Heritage Reserve. And here you can see uh, there are different blocks and Tiozini is this small one. Uh, and this is a particularly important for spawn builders and pipers and other shorebirds. And 
because uh, <clears throat> these are all uh, concrete hot uh, sea walls that behind it uh, were reclaimed, uh, uh, reclaimed uh, uh, intertidal flats, mud flats. Uh, some already were constructed or converted to farmland, if you look at here. But some are still just like uh, cutted pieces uh, of cakes. They are the cells, different uh, fish pond cells, uh, like here. Uh, besides these walls, still you can see the original uh, geomorphology. Uh, there might be some water. Uh, if people don't use it for a fish pond, then it's just uh, uh, show you the original uh, landscape over there. But some like these uh, squares are were used as a fish pond. So the local government uh, work with us. We uh, we rent one from uh, the the company who own, owns it, and then we manage the the water level, uh, low down it. And then they put uh, cameras. These are the dots of the cameras uh, to monitor the water bird population change, uh, as well uh, as uh, <clears throat> uh, the disturbances, disturbances uh, with uh, uh, human or we can see uh, artificial bird sensors, not only by the cameras. And so uh, it's really successful because uh, at, at that area, Normally, uh, we can see there are two sides. One is uh, in the seaside, uh, on the seaside, uh, in front of uh, the, the, the dike or the seawall. Uh, it was also another threat is uh, the expansion of uh, Spatina. So even though uh, there's a reclamation, but uh, if there were no uh, Spatina, uh, then at a high tide, still there might be some uh, left uh, space, higher space that the shorebirds could use. But because the Spatina, uh, they occupy the higher elevation zones. So uh, on the seaside, uh, in front of the seawall, they already lost the uh, high tidal roost. But then on the other side, behind the seawall, on the land side, uh, and normally there's, there's there are less uh, human disturbances. They're either to be reclaimed, uh, it might be converted to forest or farmland, or it converted to be solar panel power plant. Uh, but still there are some fish pond left. Uh, so normally the, the company uh, or the local or the, the private sectors, we use it for uh, aquaculture. And so low down the water level is very important and means that uh, if there are nothing left for high tide roost, you just provide one small bloat. Uh, it's, it will be very useful for water birds. Even they, uh, they jammed, uh, they crowded in uh, such a small place, but it worked. So based on the monitoring data, uh, this uh, small fish pond used to be only uh, with those uh, bubbles that uh, they have uh, the, the oxygen uh, machine uh, for, for fish or for shrimp, but now it converted it to uh, open mud flat. Mm. And then the, the water bird used to reach the near six, uh, 60 thousand uh, in, in, in September. And also the species number reached the near 30 uh, by average. So we can see during the migratory peak, uh, at Chelsea, uh, it's really played an uh, important role for for <clears throat> for bird, and also not uh, only the total number, but also uh, we noticed that uh, the highest uh, record uh, for spawnbill sandpiper reached 80. Uh, this is a really a very good number, and then also for uh, Norman's uh, green shank, uh, he reached uh, 1150. That's a, the, the it broke the historical record in the area, so we can see uh, even just a simple operation it provides an important uh, uh, habitat for these birds. And now we are undertaking uh, more activities because uh, in the beginning we are just on a, a trial stage that uh, we just low down the the water level and uh, make more mud flat uh, exposed. And then the, the birds can have shallow water. Uh, but according to our plan, in the future, we will uh, 
uh, adjust the water level and do more tests to see which will be uh, the best plan to, to provide the best uh, habitat composition. Means not only uh, shallow water for shoppers, but uh, it might be for some uh, storks, uh, such as uh, here uh, in the in the regional the regional plan is that we will set the highest water level water level for forty centimeters, and then it uh, provide a habitat for for ducks and gulls, and then uh, when the shoppers arrive. Uh, we will regulate the water level less uh, <clears throat> uh, shallower than 10 centimeters. Uh, but of course, if you could see the uh, the original geomorphology of this small pond, uh, it's not a pure plate, uh, a flat uh, plate. Uh, it also ha has a varieties uh, at a, a, of elevations. So. Uh, we will work with the local government and run uh, scientific uh, monitoring with uh, AI uh, recognition based on cameras. It's uh, automatic monitoring. And then uh, with uh, the regulation of uh, water level, it's, it's, it can be always the same water level. And besides that, uh, uh, we, well, now it's kind of uh, stage one. Uh, TZ, TZN 700 or 7, 720. And there, uh, the local government, uh, Dongtai, uh, <clears throat> the economy zone uh, uh, government or municipal government wanted to expand uh, area for high tide roost. Uh, I think it should be to the south, uh, to, let me have a look, uh, sorry. Okay, here. So we can see this is only one small pond. So in the future, it's under discussion that these areas in the neighborhood and also these areas may take more measures, particularly here as uh, this region, it, you see the dark colors are all spatina. And so we are thinking about in the future, maybe we could uh, adjust the water flow uh, from the land site and then it can flush some sediments here because uh, reclamation, we lost the ocean current uh, hydraulic here. And then maybe we can use freshwater um, uh, hydrology adjust uh, uh, or regulation to change the uh, hydrology and the geomorphology here. Then they may provide a, a suitable habitat, uh, a high tide roost for uh, shorebirds as well. Uh, so, I think uh, uh, TZN 720 provides a very good example uh, for manage a high tide roost. It's similar to uh, to uh, to my pool. Uh, I think the problem nowadays is is the the key point, the key challenge is not technology. It's not uh, how you provide uh, such as the water depths. Uh, how about uh, the the open uh, open seaside uh, open view? Uh, it's also a policy and, and how uh, the local people will use uh, these areas. It, it's, uh, for the moment, it's not uh, easy to, to control the invasion, uh, invasive species, but, you know, but also it's difficult to work with local, local government to, to uh, make uh, new policies to convert the, the land use here, uh, even the Cape, uh, the sea wall, it doesn't matter, but the key point is how they they need to convert the land use behind the sea wall as uh, uh, as more a uh, natural based solution and not just uh, uh, for aquaculture uh, or, or, or construction. So I, I think that's the whole story uh, I'd like to share today and um, uh, for TZN 720. In the future, I think there will be more good news come from uh, Tilsni and uh, maybe also from World Heritage Phase 2 uh, in China. Well, thank you. That, that's all for, for my talk. That's absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much. That's a really great example of a brand new uh, roosting site that's been created uh, in such a critically important area of the flyaway. So thank you so much for that update. Thank you. I'm keen to hand over now to Yuna Kim, who's the director of Dr. Kim's Conservation Solutions. Thank you, Yuna. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Yuna. 
I am fairly new to the shorebird world, in fact, so I would rather share my experience and thoughts as a wildlife conservationist in general. Um, I believe that conservation requires a holistic approach and teamwork, and especially migratory shorebirds that travel between countries need international collaborations. And as um, Doug mentioned in the introduction, removing language barrier is crucial uh, when you are working with um, people from all over the world. And with my experiences in liaising, non-English speaking countries, having any related documents, like let's say from meeting agenda to educational materials translated into the local language is, it, it, it will enable all parties to understand the issues and focus, uh, uh, focus on the solutions. So I was very happy to translate this important document into Korean language and honored to be a part of this global project. It's uh, impressive that this document has been translated into six different languages in just a few months and launching everything, you know, at one go, um, just amazing. And um, as far as I know, in Australia, where I'm based in, there are no guidelines spe specifically for shoreboard site. Um, and I believe it's the same for Korea and many countries along the EAA flyways. So I believe this document will open up some discussion point for the shorebird habitat management in your region. And I think David Stroud asked how we can actually disseminate this guideline to provi provincial or city authorities. Um, because you know they are the ones actually making decisions in local level and i think this uh, lunch event is the starting point like more like international level and then it's actually all you you as uh, participants you know from all over the world you should start it probably um if you are from you know federal government officials then you probably can um, you know, throw some workshop or seminar similar to this. So you um, introduce this, you introduce this guideline to um, your local uh, government officials, or you might be from bird watching club. I know a lot of bird watching club do many conservation work with the local government. So you may host something like this to actually introduce you know and hence this guideline to the uh, local area so i hope uh, many advice and uh, suggestions given in this guideline will be useful for more effective habitat management towards the shorebird conservation thank you that's wonderful thank you very much yuna uh, some really important insights there and how we can disseminate these messages to the right people um uh, our next expert panelist is Yus Noor, who's the acting director of uh, Wetlands International Indonesia. So, uh, Yus, over to you. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Richard. A few months ago, uh, I was contacted by uh, Micha, and then she was asking whether I can participate on the translation of the uh, document, a translation of the publication on the high rules of uh, sorbet. And then before I uh, finish my, uh, to read the, the email, my immediate response is, yes, I can do it. Uh, and then despite uh, what the arrangement will be, I found this is a very a good uh, opportunity to strengthen the conservation of migratory uh, sorbets in Indonesia. And then I, I found out that that my decision was very much right uh, because during the translation work, I found out this is a very uh, useful uh, publication. Uh, as Yuna mentioned, it is simple, but not to 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 simplify the the the, the problems. It is uh, uh, scientific without too much uh, heavy. Uh, on the scientific uh, matter, but uh, I think uh, 
again, my decision was right to be participated on this uh, translation. So I was asked to provide a five minutes uh, review of the publication. And then uh, what I can say uh, easily is that this publication is produced very timely uh, for Indonesia for two reasons. First is for the uh, bird watcher or bird observers like myself. This is a very useful uh, publication to move from the, 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 to move our observation level uh, beyond the, the inventory and uh, species identification level to the observation of uh, habitat uh, to link between the, the, the uh, sorbets and the habitat and uh, how the uh, provision of good habitat will provide a good uh, solution for uh, water bird uh, conservation. In this case, sorbet, uh, migratory sorbet conservation. And then the second one, which also pointed out on the publication is related with the uh, habitat management. And then again, I would say this is very timely because in Indonesia, our government now uh, had decided to have a program of uh, mangrove restoration, uh, 600,000 hectares of uh, mangrove out of uh, 3.2 million hectares will be uh, restored or rehabilitated uh, all over Indonesia. So this is not, not uh, a, a small area, 600,000 uh, uh, hectares is quite uh, large uh, and then to be uh, restored until 2024. And then this is very timely because then it will also uh, related with the uh, provision of habitat for sorbets. Uh, because there are some uh, quite uh, misunderstanding of, uh, of how mangrove should be uh, restored. And then uh, because of people very much eager and then very motivated to do the uh, restoration and then they plant uh, mangrove in every uh, available uh, habitat including a mud flap, for example. And then this will give a negative impact to the sore birds. So I think this publication will at least guide uh, the, the, the manager of the area or the government, but also the non-government organization to provide the, the, the guidance on which area need to be uh, restored and which are which area is not. In this case, for example, mud flat is not the area need to be uh, planted by mangrove. Uh, again, uh, we found that this publication will have a good impact or even a big impact uh, for this uh, land use management uh, in relation with the uh, restoration. So I think this is what I can see immediately uh, from this uh, information. And then I certainly uh, will found an, another uh, information. And then I could not provide any example of which area need to be, uh, uh, to, to, to be presented on this meeting because we have so many uh, area, suitable area for uh, high, ride, uh, high tide uh, roofs. Maybe we have uh, tens or if not uh, hundreds. Uh, but again, what I can say is that this publication is very timely and very uh, important. Uh, and that's why I think it needs to be uh, distributed as wide as possible in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, there's some very important insights there and very important issues emerging there in Indonesia. Thank you very much. Um, and now we're heading to Malaysia for our last panelist, uh, Patricia Tipol, who is the vice chair of the Malaysian Nature Society Kuching branch. Thank you, Patricia. 
Thank you. Um, hello and good afternoon, everyone. I am Patricia Tipol. For myself, I have been involved in Shoba Works quite recent, sometime in 2018. So for us, we have yet to actually work on management of high type rules, but I will share some information on the areas um, that we have. So some of you might not know, but we are located in the eastern part of Malaysia. It's, it's a state called Sarawak, it's on the island of Borneo. So for Sarawak, the most important site for migratory, migratory shorebird would have to be the Baku Buntal Bay. The area is about 3,600 hectares. And to date, it's the first and the only flyway network site under the EAAF in the entire Malaysia. So thousands of shorebirds actually utilize the bay as staging and wintering site, but one of the sites located within the area is as important. So the site is called Sujinkat Ashpan, which are not, uh, owned by the power station management. So the ash pond actually serves as the coal ash dumping site for the power station. So there are a total of three ponds within the area, but only one is currently active as the rest are overgrown. So when the high tide is, uh, when the site is high, the water will cover most of the bay. So you get to find most of the birds flying in to the ash ponds, which include up to six or seven hundreds of pies and curlews, one to two thousands of grad knots, um, a few Norman screen chang and Chinese egret in the site. So at times you get up to 9,000 individuals in a single pond. So there is still a lot of things needed to be explored in our part of the world. So recently we have been in touch with the power station people to explore the possibilities of collaborating in order to pre preserve the site for the birds. So we're still in the early stages and also we are looking forward to see how this will turn out. So we want to be able to maintain the site and to cater to the needs of the birds. So, and making sure that the maintenance of the ponds also coincide with the migration timing of the birds. We are so glad that the production of these guidelines is at the right time for us, as we have never been involved in management of high tide risk sites. We are quite inexperienced. So, but with this document, we believe that it will show us the ropes and the know-hows. So there might be differences in the site, but I'm sure there are also overla uh, overlapping items. So I'm glad to be a part of this together with um, our chairperson, Ross Au and Dr. Azani, who is a lecturer from a local university. We were able to translate the document into Malay. Thank you, Misha, for um, inviting us to translate the document. I think it's brilliant how Misha approached us and everyone into translating the documents into different languages. So especially for us, since the local communities living nearby the Ashwans are mostly Malays. So I'm sure this will come in handy and be put in use when you engage with the local community. So once again, thank you for this opportunity and for the breathing um, guideline. That's wonderful. Thank you very much, Patricia. That's uh, really uh, wonderful to hear that and great to see the active collaboration with industry uh, there to try to maintain uh, that site over the longer time period. Uh, we, uh, uh, panelist from Vietnam was unfortunately unable to join us suffering with internet trouble. Uh, so Trey Latrong, who's the Deputy Director of the Viet Nature Conservation Centre, uh, was unable to join us today, but we recognise his contribution and willingness to do so. So thank you so much to all of our panellists for really important insights from around the flyway. Um, I'd like to make sure that everybody uh, has access to the links that are in the chat. So look in the chat and you'll see links to where the guidelines can be downloaded from. Uh, they're available in multiple languages that represent several different uh, regions around the flyway. So please take advantage of uh, those links which have just been made live and you can download those documents right now. Um, we're going to go through each of our panelists and I'm just going to ask them one question uh, that's been rounded up from the chat as we've been moving through the presentations. Um, and I'd ask the panellists to keep their responses relatively brief if they're able to do so. That would be wonderful. So it, um, first of all, I'd like to ask uh, Tataya Bijiaba. Uh, we had a question about human conflict in the aquaculture ponds. You mentioned there are many aquaculture ponds in the uh, Pactale region. Do you experience any conflict with the managers of those aquaculture ponds? in ensuring the areas are good for shorebirds. Yes, thank you. Uh, that I, I mentioned usually the Pakale Nature Reserve or the Pakale Lampakbia uh, 
area dominated by the salt pan. Yes, some there's a few aquaculture pond, but uh, also few human conflict with the some water bird like a cormoran, but not the not much or few case of the conflict. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Fion Cheng, who talked about my po, um, there was much interest in the chat as to whether you use livestock to control vegetation and what your thoughts are on how useful livestock are compared to um, manual clearing. Uh, yes, and um, in fact, we have got 10 water buffaloes in the reserve and uh, two of them is now helping to manage a, an area which was previously fully, nearly fully occupied by reed. And then uh, last year, we, is it last year? No, it should be in 2000, oh no, last year. And uh, we would like to restore that that area into a very marshy freshwater uh, freshwater marsh. So that's why uh, we use a machine to cut all the reed bed and then do some kind of um, rototilling work. And then we introduce it to water buffalo in that area in order to help graze the newly regrowing reed. And now the situation is that the area is quite um, uh, is quite looking like a marshy area. That is what we want. And uh, we have to say that using livestock to some people, it may be a bit troublesome, but if they, uh, if they can help uh, control the vegetation through grazing, in fact, they can really help reducing the manpower that we need in order to do the grass cutting work. Because every day they graze, they keep managing the vegetation so they can keep the vegetation at a quite a uh, favorable uh, height. And also when they do the wallowing, they can create some, uh, some micro habitats for other wildlife, not just birds. So I have to say that buffalo, water buffaloes can really help to diversify the habitats uh, in a small area. And if we really use uh, the manual methods to cut the grass, maybe every one or two months, you have to go back to cut them. So the favorable uh, grass height can be maintained for a short time, but then, that will be out of control again, and then you have to send people there to do the grass cutting. So um, I have to say that uh, uh, it is better than really managing the site by human only. Great, thank you. It's clearly so much experience has gone into learning how to do all of this stuff, and it's very valuable experience for those of us all around the flyway. So thank you very much uh, for that. Um, I'm keen to ask Liu Kai now about the um, uh, Tauzini uh, roost site creation. It's clearly a fantastic success. So I want to pass on my congratulations for that great success. And I'm sure everyone on this call will echo those thoughts. Um, you mentioned expanding the roost site, you know, the, the areas like slices of cakes, there's lots of small ponds that could be used to create roost sites. Do you think it would be better to make a whole series of small sites or a small number of very large roosting sites? Have you thought about that kind of trade-off yet? Uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, I think it is, it's, it's difficult because uh, um, have the single large or, or uh, or small, uh, small many is you know a controversial argument in the theory, ecological theory, but in practice we don't have that space. It's uh, it's because I, I mentioned that the small block, the small piece of cake is we we work with local government and local government 
paying the rent to the company. The company actually is a provincial uh, company. It's also part of a government. So you can see it's funny uh, because of the, the, the land ownership, it should be a uh, local, uh, we, we call it a collaborative uh, ownership of the land, but actually because it, it's reclaimed. So the provincial branch owns it. So the local government wants to use it, they have to pay the money. Like uh, I think they paid uh, several million yuan per year for two that small. They call it uh, TZN 720, but uh, it's only 48 uh, hectares. So <laughs> you can see uh, in, uh, we tried, and, and then in the beginning, they lobbied uh, the, the provincial branch, tried to expand the area. But uh, it seems uh, this year they failed. So to the north, uh, if they want to get more pieces, it's difficult. But to the south, uh, that's uh, a small estuary. Uh, the land ownership was totally local owned. So that's why we want to expand to the south, but not uh, to the north. That's the situation. But I think uh, it's useful to provide a kind of a national policy, a national policy for the next step is behind the seawall. How can we uh, wisely manage the area? That could be uh, the optimal solution to it. It's, it because uh, it's not ecologists, you can see, let's do a, a run an experiment for a single large or many small. It's, it's really telling. Okay, uh, that's, that's my answer. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. <laughs> really uh, thought provoking stuff. Yeah. Um, Yuna Kim, I'd like to um, develop something you said. You mentioned the importance of breaking down language barriers for helping us collaborate across the flyway. Um, what kind of, uh, how do you think site managers might um, collaborate with each other? Can you think of what sort of strategies might there be for managers of shorebird roosts to share their experiences across the flyway? Yeah, I guess language barriers, like obviously if you use different languages, um, you need to have all the documents translated into the local languages. I know even like let's say in India, within the same country, they will have multiple languages. So it is really important for that local area. You have to have the educational materials or meeting materials translated. And then also when you are inviting, you know, the experts, let's say scientists, they should try to use, even if they use the same language, if they use all the scientific, you know, jargons, local people will be pulled off. So they should use more uh, friendly um, you know, languages. That's what I think uh, this guideline approach, it's not to, it is based on the science evidence, but it is very easy to read. So yeah, that's, it's good. Good job, Misha and Bill and many others involved in this publication. That's great. Thank you very much, you know, wonderful. Um, yes, I'd like to ask a little bit about the mangrove restoration proposal for Indonesia. It sounds like a very, very large project. And I was wondering which places you think should be prioritized for mangrove restoration. You mentioned we should avoid mud flats, but which places should be the priorities for mangroves, do you think? Yeah. Yeah, the, the program of 600,000 uh, hectare uh, rehabilitation is ongoing project at the moment. Uh, not, not a project, ongoing program uh, by the gov government. This is fall under the improvement of economic improvement program. So it is the, the, the basic uh, uh, background of this program is related with uh, economic improvement of local community uh, because of the COVID uh, situation. But on the other hand, uh, we also realized that mangrove rehabilitation uh, need to be done. And then that's why the government used the, the, the uh, word uh, acceleration instead of the normal speed. So it should be there, it should be done quickly. Uh, but then the challenge is how to put the nature 
consideration into the program. And then this is a big uh, challenge uh, because it's not easy to find 600,000 hectares uh, in, 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 in uh, four years, for example. And then uh, this is the reason why then we work with so many people, so many organizations, so many NGO to provide the uh, uh, to provide the guidance, to provide an input to government which area need to be uh, uh, restored. And then the go our government then decided uh, nine uh, provinces to be uh, restored uh, for the uh, next four years. Uh, so I think uh, we are not, uh, I, I cannot say which area uh, of location, but in these nine uh, provinces of Indonesia, uh, the, the area will be uh, restored. And then what we can do now is just to provide the information about the, the which area is important for uh, migratory sorbets. And then for this reason, for example, the result of Asian weather bird census, we have done this for almost 30 uh, plus years now. And then we have the good idea of which area is also uh, important for uh, migratory sorbets. For example, we can say that in South Sumatra, for example, this is very important area for uh, migratory sorbets and please do the, the, the restoration carefully and then put the migratory uh, sorbets on the first consideration, for example. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. There's great uh, insights. It's uh, clearly a very important issue there for Indonesia over the next few years. Um, I'd like to finish with Patricia. Um, you mentioned about the the ash ponds management being crucial for the long-term future of this roosting site. And I think this type of issue is something we see quite a lot in artificial shorebird reefs. Um, I was wondering, how does the long-term future look? It, you know, how long is the um, ash ponds going to be managed in a sensible way? Shorebirds, do you see risk? You mentioned that some of the ash ponds have already become vegetated and unsuitable for shorebirds. Do you think that's a risk over the long term for the whole site? Oh, yes. Oh, so yes. Yes. So, yes. So, yes. yes, that's, yes. that's, that's the, the reason why, why we are also, are also trying to trying collaborate, to collaborate with, the, with the power plant power management. Plant management. So, they are so they are also worried that one, one day they no longer. longer. We, we have some oh, echo on your mind. Oh okay. oh okay. Hold on. Hold on. Is it is it better? Is it better? Is that better? Is that better? <laughs> Hold on, maybe I should turn off my off my speaker perhaps. Okay, is this better? Yes, thank you. All right. So um this is why we have um trying to see how we can collaborate with the power power station management. Because they're also worried that what if one day there's no longer ash pumping into the ponds and what if the birds are not um, coming into the site. So how do we want to manage the site so that the birds still come in the future? So that is what we also trying to do together with the government, Sarawak Forestry Corporation, who are very supportive. So we are trying to see and trying to consult with expert uh, experts to figure out how we can manage this issue. But currently, we're still at the new stage, so there's not much to, to say about it. Okay, that's great. Thank you for that. And thanks for your efforts on in protecting that very important site. Um, so that brings an end out the panel component of this session. And I really want to thank each of the panel members. And I think what we've seen is just such an exciting array of experiences from all around the flyway. And it shows and showcases the kind of expertise that's gone into the development of these guidelines and the practical protection for shorebirds all around the flyway. So I thank all of you for your strong commitment to shorebird conservation. And I really wanna thank everybody involved in preparing and disseminating the shorebird guidelines, especially uh, to Misha and Phil, who've led this project from the beginning and have really made it the great success that it is now. So just before we finish, I'd like to hand over to Misha 
uh, just to close out the session with a few words. Uh, thank you very much, Misha. Look, thank you, Rich. And uh, yeah, again, a huge thanks to uh, our wonderful uh, panel of experts for sharing your very deep expertise and your very important experiences. We can see that across different areas, uh, some challenges are different, some challenges are very similar. Uh, and it's important to acknowledge uh, both of those things, I think. So thank you very much uh, to the panelists uh, for their time today. Huge thanks as well uh, to Phil uh, uh, for his uh, co-editing uh, of the guidelines and also his remarks earlier. Uh, thank you to the Flyway Partnership and the Australasian Waiter Study Group for helping us to host this webinar. Uh, but, but just as much so, thank you for all of you who attended and to all of your uh, wider networks who do so much uh, to help protect uh, water birds in our flyway. There are so many inspiring things going on in the last few years and I have much more optimism than I did even a few years ago uh, because we've seen some amazing uh, successes and uh, positive outcomes for the birds in the last few years, even though there are still significant challenges. So thank you to all of you for your interest in the birds, uh, for attending today, for all the work that you do. And to everyone on the call who is not a native English speaker, who English is not your first language, thank you so much for participating today uh, in English so that we can all uh, talk together. Uh, it's uh, underappreciated the extra effort that's needed to participate in these kind of things if English is not your first language. So thank you very much for that. And uh, I think with that, we can uh, sign off. We haven't gone too far over time. Um, so thanks, thanks to everyone for a great event. Uh, I guess Vivian, your team can sign off the webinar now, unless you have anything else. Yes, so um, just a little note. Um, um, we are going to um, upload this video, this webinar on the YouTube channel of EAFP so that afterwards you can um, refresh back and you can see the um, QR code um, that you can you can now download all the uh, different languages of the guidelines from the from the EAFP website. We post a news article up there and also for uh, from the AWSG website as well. So yeah, please uh, keep on following up uh, with uh, EAFP activities on our website and the social media channels. And yeah, we uh, hope to see you all again. Um, thank you very much. And thank you for all the speakers and um, Professor Fuller for the moderating. And of course, uh, Micha and Phil for, uh, from the AWSG for bringing um, this wonderful and inspiring webinar to us. Thank you.